Welcome to this special edition of 1036, Listen MKE. I'm Portia Young. Listen MKE began as a year long project involving the Ideas Lab of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, WUWM 89.7 Milwaukee's NPR, and the Milwaukee Public Library to create listening opportunities for our residents living on Milwaukee's North Side. It started at last year's Juneteenth Day. Milwaukee PBS is now bringing together the partners in order to help bring together our community in light of the recent protests after the murder of George Floyd and the message that Black Lives Matter. Two of my fellow media colleagues join me now and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm James Causey, Journal Sentinel's Projects Reporter in 2019-2020, Marquette University O'Brien Fellow. I'm Taryn Powell, the race and ethnicity reporter at WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, James, for being with us. Now, before we listen to the event that you hosted on Facebook Live for Listen NKE, we want you to look at some of the striking images from recent protests around Milwaukee and the message that marchers want us to listen carefully to. Those images from several Milwaukee Journal Sentinel photographers are powerful, and so is listening and trying to move the dialogue forward. This past Tuesday, Listen MKE became a Facebook Live event. We interviewed two community leaders about the goals of the activists who are marching and what the community needs most right now. Let's listen. Joining me for a conversation today, Marquesa Tucker, Director of the African American Roundtable, and Pastor Walter Lanier of Progressive Baptist Church. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks uh, for having me. Marquesa, I'm going to start with you. Uh, can you talk about your role with the African American Roundtable? I actually came to the African American Roundtable through our organization, Wisconsin Voices. Uh, and so I came to Wisconsin Voices in January 2014 as an office manager and was uh, promoted to the director of the Roundtable in August of 2017 after working with the Hamilton family um, around Dontre's murder, but also after supporting them in some of the work that they had done on the ground. Um, and since then, we've kind of done some work around the DOJ. So specifically, the Roundtable is a coalition of leaders throughout uh, our community, Black leaders, who are working to ensure that the people uh, have power to do the things necessary in the community to get the things that they want, like some of the things that we'll talk about in the demand. But we want to make sure that our people are able to thrive and to live in this community in Milwaukee. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the demands. Um, you guys made news recently when you came up with a list of demands. What, what are those demands and how do you plan to get them accomplished? Absolutely. So just to give a little background on that, last uh, year, the African American Roundtable started a campaign called Liberate MKE. We launched it last year on Juneteenth, and we just pretty much a co the coalition of folks on the core team at the African American Roundtable tried to figure out what can we organize around together. So many of us are doing so many things, you know, around jails, around health care all sorts of topics, but what was one thing that we could agree on and build on? And we all agreed that the police budget was completely unjust and out of whack. And so once we went and looked at it and started to share that information with people, realizing that the city budget was almost 50% of the entire city budget, we knew then that this was an opportunity for us to engage the community and to allow them to organize around their own ideas. So that's where Liberate MKE came from. It came from a community idea on how we can get investment back into our community and to help straighten an unjust budget out. And so 
Our request uh, last year was a $25 million divestment from the Milwaukee Police Department to go back into community initiatives like uh, violence prevention, youth employment, housing. And so last year we were actually able to organize the community come out to get $15 million divested with 900,000 of that money going toward youth employment for summer earn and learn, um, also to affordable quality housing. We have a program that we still are working to put together. And then the last thing would be violence interruption. So we just built upon that. And we know in the, uh, in the environment we're in right now, you know, we're hearing defund the police all over the country. And we're glad that we were able to start this work last year and start to educate our community around what it looks like to get investment back. So it's not about, you know, um, people, oh, you know, you guys are uh, this about the police, that about the police. We're about community and community investment. So some of the uh, demands that we have are specifically for public safety. We know that police do not keep us safe. They are not intervening bodies. They are reactionary bodies. And so we have asked for a $75 million divestment from MPD to reinvest back into building healthy communities that can thrive. And we want 50 million to go back into uh, public health and 25 million into housing cooperatives. Another one of our demands are the rights of protesters be respected and not harmed and no harm come to them. We know that um, our mayor, our police chief, along with the county executive, asked uh, Governor Evers to bring the National Guard here. That isn't what keeps people safe. It's a waste of taxpayers' money or whoever's paying for it. It's a waste of their money. And we would prefer to see that uh, protesters who have the right are not tear gassed. <laughs> um, they're not hit with rubber bullets. And any of the tickets or the fines that they're receiving in regards to that would be dropped. We are also asking for justice for Joel Acevedo. We know that the officer was charged and has yet to be terminated. And so we stand with the family and ask that the Fire and Police Commission, Chief Morales, whoever's hands it is, to assure this family that he will be fired. And we're also asking for the three named accomplices in the, um, the criminal complaint to also be brought to justice. Uh, we also are asking the FPC to continue to be the voice of the community. As a civilian body, we want to ensure that that investigation of that officer remains with the FPC and not go back to the police department. We also want to ensure that the accountability to the community would arrest with the community and that Common Council President Cavalier Johnson to immediately appoint members to the Community Collaborative Committee, which did the work around the DOJ recommendations after Dontre's murder. The last two would be around responding to the executive order to uh, bring the National Guard here. So instead of the National Guard coming here, we're asking that housing, um, that implementation and a moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, rents, mortgage, utility, and disconnections from Milwaukee County residents through the end of 2020 be put in order. We are still in a pandemic. I think people are forgetting because the stay at home are you know lifting and people are going out. We're still fighting COVID. Uh, the last one is healthcare, a declaration of racism in the state of Wisconsin as a public health crisis. Public and private institutions must be expanded to ensure Milwaukee County residents and have access to affordable health care. We were able to uh, get some of these um, these demands from SJAC, which is St. Joe's Accountability Coalition, that came together when um, Ascension was looking to really shut down and debunk St. Joe's Hospital. Yeah, th th those are quite a bit of demands. Uh, do you believe the uh, mayor and the common council have the fortitude to make the necessary changes to MPD uh, in this new age of policing? We believe that the power, a lot of this power we know rests with the mayor. We know a lot of this power represent, uh, sits with the chief, but we know also that the Fire and Police Commission is the uh, most powerful governing body in the country. So a lot of this power also resides with them around SOPs, but also the mayor and the Common Council have a hand in this budget and how this money is going to be invested in or outside of the community. And again, we are also knowing that the Fire and Police Commission and the and Chief Morales, they have an obligation to answer that call to, uh, to Joel Acevedo's family about whether or not that officer is going to be terminated. It's one of the two that can do it. They need to figure out who that is and make it happen. Pastor, uh, the, the question for you is what role should the church play, especially now in the role of social justice? The church needs to walk alongside the community. Prayerfully, it's been doing that already, but if not, it does need to do that to hear, uh, as Marquesa has said, what is the heart of the community? Uh, what are the demands of the community? 
Uh, how can we amplify the voice of community? How can we speak truth to power? Uh, sometimes our voice will be received differently uh, than those at the grassroots uh, level in the community organizers. And so sometimes we need to raise our voice uh, loudly when we see injustice, a lack of accountability taking place here in the city. As we talk about the demands and different community organizers coming together in the church, being a part of the conversation um, and having demands, how long are you guys prepared to, to wait if that's something that you're told by people in uh, leadership positions? Is that a conversation that group organizations are having? Yeah, there is no time for waiting. We're, we're beyond waiting. I think I read this in an article last night with Daryl Gibson from Lit. We there. This is the moment. There is no waiting. There is no taking pauses. We have been asking for these types of things for years and years and years. People have now taken the streets to I think it's going on 11 or 12 days. The time is now for people to respond to what people in this community want, what taxpayers are paying for. These are our tax dollars and we deserve today the investment that the people in this city deserve and the people in the city need to live and to thrive. So no, we're not um, having any questions and conversations around you know, what the timetable is gonna look like. No, we are demanding these things need to be done ASAP. People wanna be a part of this movement. They feel like they wanna do something. What can people do? How can they be a part of this? People need to uh, support what's already going on. That's one thing. But also take some time to do some learning. The church needs to learn and the community who's never been engaged in this work needs to learn. Also figure out what is what is your purpose? What is the call that God has put in your life? What is it that you love to do? You might be a communications person. You might love social media. You might love speaking out and typing up emails to uh, city and elected officials. Figure out what it is that you're really good at and find a way to support these organizations that are already doing the work on the ground. What happens after the protests? What's, what's next? Absolutely. Well, right now, I don't think these protests are going to stop until some of these demands are met. So right now, it's what can happen after the protests, which is continually developing leaders, teaching people how to organize. We are doing an amazing job in Milwaukee with Frank and uh, Frank Nitty and Khalil really leading and mobilizing people to the streets, which is an important part of the movement work to keep the energy going and to keep our face and our messages in front of people until we get what we want. And I'm hearing that they're ready to stay in those streets until we get what we want. If you can try to uh, help Help us understand what that divest, uh, when, you, when you take money from the police department and you put it into programs, how does crime and how does crime go down and how does that improve community and neighborhoods and things like that? Can you walk us through that process of how you envision this working? Absolutely. So when we started Liberate MKE, we partnered with Black leaders organizing with communities or for communities. And the one thing that I know Black had been doing since August of 2017, when they hit the ground, knocking on doors daily up until just COVID hit, um, was having conversations with people. What would it look like for you to thrive? Just a really simple question. And people said stuff like, oh, you know, access to, you know, food, um, you know, clean water, access to transportation so we can get to jobs, quality education. You know, people know that when they have the things that they need, their basic needs met, we can reverse tons of things because guess what we're doing? We're actually preventing some things from happening because people are going to have jobs, because people are going to have access to food, and people are going to have access to transportation to get to their jobs. So we're talking about what does prevention look like, and investing in prevention is a way better investment than doing something that doesn't, and there's been reports done. Policing doesn't necessarily in crime. It doesn't slow crime. It doesn't wrap crime. So if we already have the reports out there, we have the messaging, and we know that prevention actually works, then what are we waiting for to put resources and money to what we know works? There has been an announcement about forming a commission for police reform. Has Liberate MKE been contacted or affiliated with this sentiment? So we're not sure what's happening, but it's all it's very confusing to the community for the mayor to start another committee when there's already another committee. I'm not for any more committees. We're over committees. We just want our demands met at this point. What does 
real community policing look like? It looks like community being in control of their own communities. We know that, and for some people, they're just like, oh, you know, I just can't see, I can't imagine, you know, any world without police. You know, well, I could never imagine, I think probably when I was younger, actually hearing that people would say defund the police. But guess what? That's the moment that we're in right now. Um, and we are saying as this uh, generation of people, we will not continue to uh, stay in the status quo, to try to work within a system that we know has never worked and is not going to work. So that looks like us taking control of our own communities, which we know because of so much generational trauma, so much wrong and oppression and uh, devaluing and de divestment to our communities has caused a, a opportunity for us to take this step back and say, okay, in the same vein of us talking about uh, reinvesting into our communities, what does it look like for us to start also putting our own thing together around what it looks to community uh, police? Well, I won't even use the word police, but community control of our own communities to take care of ourselves. We know what we need to take care of ourselves. We need the resources poured in to help us to do that. And we're trying to do that with some of the initiatives that we've asked for. Yeah, yeah. I, I received a, uh, uh, someone is sending me a private message and they basically say that uh, if we uh, move to a strategy where we're removing police, there would be mayhem everywhere um, and no one to control it. You, I pretty much know what your response would be to that, but I want to hear it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, this is not something that we're about to get ready and do tonight. You know, we are not about to get ready and do tomorrow. This is going to have to be, again, a parallel conversation around investing resources, simultaneously while we are taking those investments and resources and putting together plans, opportunities and programs for our own communities to be in their own communities taking care of them. But we need resources, money is needed for everything. The health department in the current budget going towards 2021, I think they're getting under 3%. That's where the violence prevention um, uh, program is. And also I saw Nate mention as well, we absolutely have to be involved in this budget process, talking about participatory budget, that's going to be something else we'll, you uh, folks in the community will hear this year. We have to be at the table, not on the side of the table, not behind the table, not after the fact. We have to be at the table making the decisions because this is our city. We pay taxes and they are actually working for us. Let's talk a little bit about um, some comments made by the police chief. Um, he said water bottles were being thrown at officers. Um, mm -hmm. we, we discussed a Molotov cocktail incident. Um, and he also com he, he made some statements that I, I think some people would say got him in hot water where he compared his officers saying that they've been uh, crucified or something to that, to that, uh, to that. Another disgusting comment. Just, just, so, you know, but, when you're saying. But, my, but my, question, my, my question is this, um, the he feels that a level of respect has been lost when it comes to citizens as towards police. And I, I wanna see what you think about that. Has to, can this be something that could be repaired or what needs to take place? So the respect has been lost a long time ago. Um, you know, we could go back to the list, you know, Derek Williams, Dondra Ham, like the list is ongoing of people who have been killed by police, not just killed by police, but mishandled by police, the strip searches, the list can go on. So respect has been lost for police long time ago. Like I said, if it's rooted in slavery, I can't respect uh, you know, a culture that has not and will not change. It's clear. This culture cannot be changed because the root is, it's dead. It's rooted in something that will not allow people to live peacefully or safely. So if he wants to go back and backtrack to the history of policing and find out where respect was lost, he can go back to the beginning when uh, they were put in place to uh, herd people back and to make sure they were still on their passes, you know, in the right neighborhoods. So no, we, we don't want to hear about uh, respect at this time. And as far as police, they're servants, so they should be already respecting the people that pay their salaries and the people that they are to serve. They put themselves in this position. They apply for it. They got the job. So if you want to serve the people, serve the people in the role that you're in or speak up and be that voice that says, you know what? Officer Mattioli needs to be fired. You're absolutely right. He needs to be fired. He's got to go. Speak up and be that voice and come from behind that blue shield. What does real solidarity between the community 
and the police look like to you? Yeah, I'll reiterate my last comment. It looks like police on the inside coming from behind the blue shield and saying, yeah, this is not only not right, but we support the community that Officer Mattioli needs to go. So it's saying that and it's saying, yeah, you know what? Our budget is completely unjust and out of whack, you know, just completely out of balance. And we do need to figure out a way of how we can defund ourselves to make sure that our neighbors, if they live in our communities, if the police even live in our communities, if our neighbors or these communities that we say we care about have what they need, they need to speak up and come from behind the blue shield. So I just want to take a couple of Facebook questions mm -hmm. and any other comments about unification among groups in the movement. The movement uh, is doing above what one think its capacity is to do. In other words, it's not well resourced, doesn't have big dollars. This is on the hearts and the passions and the minds of the people. One of the tragedies in this city and in other places that organizations and institutions that have the authority and the bandwidth to create structures to bring people together uh, are often not doing that. And so I know that all movements are organic with some structure and there are some opportunities to tie together. I do believe in Milwaukee that the more we get an understanding of who we are, who does what well and how we build together, we always say the people united will never be defeated. I, I think that's true. I wanted to comment on that. Um, when you, uh, when Marquesa was talking earlier about power and what the power institutions are, and I know she would have went further, uh, she talked about the power of the city common council, the power of the mayor, the power in the fire police commission. Um, uh, the ultimate power is with the people as we get more and more unified uh, and organized. That's where the power is. And uh, that is a, a, a truth. That's where everybody needs to get on board. If the people who were in the seats of power had the capacity and the will to make these changes, they would have been made it or made already. They have not been made. So either A, they lack the capacity to do it, or B, they lack the will to do it, but it's not been done. And so it's got to come from a different place. Thank you, James and Taryn, for hosting that event on Facebook Live. It got a lot of engagement. A lot of people were liking and sharing their comments during it. So I just want to ask, and I'll start with James, what struck you most about that conversation from Listen NKE? When Marquesa Tucker was talking about the uh, relationship between community and police and how it's been uh, fractured over the years and she didn't believe that it could ever be fixed. And if you think about it, for a lot of things to work, we, we sort of need police and citizens to work together. And if, if that's a uh, relationship that can never be repaired, then we're in for a lot of, a, a long journey. Mm -hmm. Taryn? I would have to say, you know, as James said, there were a lot of points made, a very good conversation, I think, there are two things that stuck with me and that she talked about that there were, there's no more need for more commissions to be made when there are organizations on the ground um, that have been doing this work for years, um, trying to change the community. Um, and, and we were speaking like along with the FPC, you know, another commission that was coming up for police reform. I've heard a number of people say we didn't need more commissions. And then the other thing that stuck out to me was she's like, we're, we're not going to wait anymore. Um, you know, our leaders need to make moves immediately. You know, I, I, there was this, you know, the feeling we've waited long enough. There's no more waiting. We have these demands. They need to be met now or what we're seeing happening. You know, the protesting is going to keep happening until there are changes made. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've been telling friends and colleagues as we've been talking about, I mean, this is the universal conversation going on right now in America, is that the promise of our country is that change can happen quickly. We think about just the span of history and time, we're 250 years old. I mean, you look at other places in the world, much older ancient cultures, and here change does happen. Think of where we were just in my mother's lifetime. So that does give me hope. Was there anything else hopeful that came out of that conversation on Facebook from Listen MKE for you? For I, I guess for me, the hope uh, stems from the protesters and the young people who are out there every day marching and, and letting their voices be heard and not being deterred by um, the people from the outside telling them that their voices don't matter. Um, their voices do matter their votes matter 
and them being out there every day matters. And, and just to see that energy uh, is, is refreshing. And because of that, we will see change. I would echo James's comments. I, I'm not very much older than, than the youth that are out there, but I'm always like, I love to see the young people getting involved and in raising their voices on serious issues because people, you know, they might write them off like they're too young. They don't understand what's going on, but these kids, they see everything and they're out there with their parents and their friends. And that gives me hope. With that, thank you, Taryn Powell from WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR, and to James Causey from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Listen, MKE, I think it's a great platform and I'm proud that Milwaukee PBS is able to partner and to be able to give it even more eyes and ears to be able to listen to these very important conversations our community needs to have. And thank you for watching this special edition of 1036, hoping that we all learn something so we can better understand some of the issues that we're facing in our community. Watch for our website, milwaukeepbs.org and our Facebook page for updates about the future Listen MKE programs and to hear more voices and responses putting change in place. Thank you for watching the special edition of 1036. I'm Portia Young.